Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we are so thankful in our hearts, Lord, that we have an opportunity to worship you corporately. That we can get together like this, not forsaking the gathering of the saints. And we pray, Lord, that you will touch every heart in a special way. Minister to everyone, Lord, as we go through the teaching of the word. I pray that the Holy Ghost will illuminate that which everyone needs to hear. But Lord, above all, we ask the ability, the grace to put into practice that which we are being taught. Not only today, but every time when a preacher from this congregation stands here and preaches the undiluted word of God, that people will take hold of that and that they will apply it in their lives, that everyone may grow to full maturity in Christ Jesus. Lord, I cannot but pray again that you will make of us soul winners, that you will cause the burden of evangelism and soul winning and uh, discipleship to come upon these dear people. We may be few in number, but Lord, we are available. We want to see Kenmia saved. We want to see Muhali cities changed. And so, Father, we pray that you will work mightily in and through us. I pray that you will unite us together. And even as we plan to have days, family days, fun days, that we will have a bonding like nothing else. That the love that you have shed abroad in our hearts will unite us and cause us to be one as you desire us to be one. The name of Jesus. And therefore, Lord, we dispel this morning every negative thought, every negative idea, every negative word, every negative attitude in the mighty name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that we can worship you and that we can praise you. Linda, let me just pray for you. She had a, a bit of an anxiety attack, and it's a very dangerous thing on the road. And I know what it feels like. It's not a, it's not a nice thing. And we come against the Spirit in the name of Jesus that causes anxiety and fear and stress. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we command it to go. And you will leave Linda. You will leave her mind. And Lord, I pray that in the place of this thing that goes now, you give her peace and joy. Uh, uh, unspeakable and full of glory. Lord, cause her to rest in the Lord. Help her, Lord, to just rest in you. And I pray blessing upon her business. I pray blessing upon her father where she's now having to, to take on more and, and uh, take responsibility for looking after others. And Lord, it's, it can be a very stressful thing. And so Lord, I pray for the wisdom and the guidance and the strength that you strengthen with might by your Holy Spirit in her innermost being that she will feel the strength of God pulsating through her whole body. And I pray, Lord, for healing from every condition that is not of God in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, because you've given her a great intellect that she would be able to, to find new ways of doing things, creative ways. And that she will go from strength to strength, blessing to blessing in her business. And, Lord, that you will raise her up. I pray for a new bucky for her. I pray for new equipment. I pray for help that she needs. I pray, Lord, for an abundance over her life in the name of Jesus. For now, Lord, be mindful of it that she has been faithful even in the giving uh, and, and uh, not able to always come every service. But she has been faithful in what she's doing. And I'm asking you on her behalf in the name of Jesus now. Lord, release the blessing. Release that blessing that she needs. And Satan, you, you take your hands off. You take your hands off in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for that. I believe breakthrough is coming. You've been persevering. And uh, God has noticed that. And God has seen that. And breakthrough is coming. Just believe him. Don't believe the circumstances. Believe what God um, has for you. Meditate on that. Meditate on his word. Keep yourself in the word. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Oh, no, I just uh, want to say to you, the time is coming close. God's going to open up for you the, the door for our home church. And uh, Cor will uh, support you in that. I know I see him baking the muffins and things like that. He will, he will support you and uh, the two of you together will 
have that home church. But it will be def- different than the times that you've tried before. Because God, God's going to move in a powerful way and bring in people. And uh, so just prepare your heart for it. Prepare um, your, your study of the word and, and uh, you know, where you're going to do what. And uh, remember, you only need ten. Only need ten for now. And uh, Lord, I pray that you bring contacts, uh, people, send people there, and Lord, raise up that home church in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, Anna Marie, the same for you. I see it's coming. God is moving. God is doing. God is placed to you. It's not in vain that you've moved where you are. And there may be at first a little bit of resistance there, but God's going to win the victory. And, and, and I see a greater Um, uh, flow in your life uh, when it comes to preaching and sharing the word of God, a greater boldness and a fluency. Uh, You're not going to struggle in saying what you need to say. Boldness is going to come. You've got a softness, but God's going to make you more firm in that softness. Uh, when it comes to the Lord. And I'm not talking about other things because you're a real fighter. But when it comes to the things of God, there's a softness and a gentleness. And, uh, but God's going to give you a greater boldness and, a f- and, a, and a, almost a firmness to, to bring His Word in great power. So, so just get ready for that. Amen. God is going to do it. Say, God is going to do it. God is going to do it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Joe and Amanda, I want to just encourage your hearts. God is by far not finished with you. You've seen, you've experienced, you've ministered, you've done things, but God is by far not finished with you. There's a, there's a new excitement and a new uh, 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 a bubbliness that will come and will move you into even greater ministry that you've experienced before. And so just know that God's hand is upon you. God's called you. You're here by design because God has, has wanted it like that. And I see in the future your home will be opened also to others to, to minister. Maybe to the one, the twos. And who knows what God will do in the future. It depends on how you desire after Him. My advice is just to seek after Him with all of your heart and find out what He wants you to do at this season of your life. Amen. You've got much to give. You've got much to give uh, in, the, in the things of God. And uh, we are thrilled to have you with us. Amen. Now, what am I going to preach on today? Yaku cannot say anything. <laughs> the last few uh, weeks I've been preaching strongly on evangelism. And we're going to do that. It's a few things that we need to just sort out and plan. I just want to say this, that uh, uh, for everyone that wants to be on the team that goes out uh, before the Sunday evening service, and there may be times that we will also go out on Saturdays, but if you're going to be part of that, uh, you need to really give your name because there's going to be a T-shirt bought. It's a very expensive, very high-quality T-shirt. And uh, we're not going to charge you all of the costs. The church will give most of it. You'll maybe pay a hundred rand, and it will be one that will fit you. Uh, it's very, good, very good quality. Printed everything. Um, what we want to print on the on the front is "I care" or "We care," and on the back will be the logo of the the church, Shiloh Christian Family Church. And uh, we're going to go from house to house. And see if we can uh, meet with the people. If not, we'll just leave the written word with them. I also believe in following up eventually, and we, we trust in God now for the finance for that. That in following up, we will be able to give them a memory stick. But one in a, in a little holder with the emblem on it. You get very nice ones. And... Uh, so that uh, it costs a little bit of money. And so trust with us for the finance for that. Amen. That, that when we get to the follow-up, which will be maybe in a few months' time, that we will have enough to at least cover Kenmia. And, and, get, and on that memory stick, 
will be a good, powerful evangelical sermon and maybe a few other sermons and uh, uh, also some, a song or two. And uh, we want to reach our community for Jesus. Amen. And the more they see us in the streets, the more they see us busy, the more they take note of us. And when they are in trouble, they'll know where to go. Because the flyer is already there. We just need to print it. It looks beautiful. We took our old flyer. And instead of our photo and church times and things, we've put their home churches. And then every address and contact number of the existing home churches. So that people will be able to contact um, the home church pastors. And we're going we're gonna to see God move. Amen. So when you think of the evangelism, the home churches speak positive and pray positive over them. Because we want to bring in the harvest. Amen. Shalomet mai. Praise the Yera. Now, the message that I want to share with you today, I've entitled it, The Open Doors to Rebellion and Pollution. Satan always seeks to get people in a position of rebellion. Think of the Tower of Babel. God said, spread ye upon all the face of the earth and, and populate the whole world. And they said, no way. We will get together. We are of one tongue, one language, and we will build ourselves a tower that will reach into heaven. That was a, a direct rebellious move against the commandment of God. They did not want to retain God in their memory. They did not want to follow the instructions of God. And so they were, they were uh, 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 gathered around a man called Nimrod. The Bible says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He did not hunt uh, animals. He hunted men. He was a murderer. And he was a very strong dictator and a tyrant. And so people uh, flocked around him. And he said, now we're going to build, and we're going to build ourselves a name, make ourselves a name, and we're going to stand against heaven, against God. And that was obviously inspired by the devil. It was an antichrist spirit that was at work there. And so when it comes to uh, rebellion, uh, it is a very serious thing to God. It's a thing that not, must be rooted out from amongst the children of God. It must be rooted out from the church. Because if you've got rebellious children, rebellious people, you will never be able to enter the promised land that God has for you. Think of Israel of old. The whole of the nation rebelled but two. Uh, that was Joshua and Caleb and, and Moses, obviously. Uh, and uh, they were so rebellious God could not do, could not give to them what He wanted to give to them. God wants to give us Kenmia. God wants to give us Mukhali City. God wants to give us the souls of this place. But if we are going to be rebellious against God, it may take a longer time. We don't have much time. We don't want to wait for a long time until everybody is sifted out and everybody is in unity. And so I want to encourage you, make a decision today that you're not going to rebel against God. You're not going to give any place to the spirit of rebellion, but you're going to go with God and you're going to enter the promised land and you're going to see your ministry uh, develop and you're going to see souls born into the kingdom of God. How many of you know by now, you should know by now, that we all have the same calling, and we all have the same purpose, and that purpose is to bring souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may be an engineer, you may be an accountant, you may have your own business, you may be whatever, but in that position, God wants you to focus on the salvation of souls. If you're in a high position, you're in a better position to influence people under you, your workers, your subordinates, to serve the Lord and to create opportunities for them in the office or wherever where they can get together, pray together. You will always find some Christians that want to pray and want to sing and want to have devotion. Make that time for them. Amen. It's time that we bring the Bible and God 
back into our businesses, into our societies, into our daily lives, and into our schools. Amen. It's when they have removed that uh, privilege from schools and government organizations and, and from companies even that we have seen an increase in corruption and uh, 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 evil in the nation. There's only one force that can stop corruption, that can stop evil, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the power manifested through every child of God that's serious with God, that proclaims boldly the gospel. And uh, I, I want you to know that even though there may be policies in place and laws in place that bids you and limits you, I want you to know it is against the word of God because God says you are to preach the gospel. And I want you to stir it up and to do it. And don't be afraid of the persecution that, are, uh, that will ensue. God will always honor you. God will always make a way for you. Even if they fire you, God will make a way for you because you are true to Him. And God knows how to deliver His people out of, out of bondage. Just ask Daniel and the lion, you know, as we've heard this morning. <laughs> God knows how to deliver His people. And so I want us to read Zephaniah. Zephaniah, did you know Zephaniah is in the Bible? Zephaniah, ne? How do you say it in Afrikaans? Zephaniah. Zephaniah, Zephaniah, 3 verse 1 to 2. Listen very carefully. It says, Woe to her, and it can also be him, who is rebellious and polluted to the oppressing city. Isn't it so that we find ourselves in society today where we feel oppressed by city governments, local governments, national governments? Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed His voice. She has not obeyed His voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. That is what a rebellious person does. That is characteristic of a rebellious person, people, city, nation. Okay? Let's deal with the word woe. The Bible says woe to the rebellious. And, and when the Bible says woe, you find it a few times in the Bible and also in the book of Revelation. Woe means there's going to come grievous distress to the rebellious. Grievous distress. There's going to be trouble or affliction. It really speaks of coming judgment. God judges those who are rebellious. God judges even in the church those who are rebellious. Now rebellious, a rebellious person likes, this is how you can identify very easily a rebellious person. They like to challenge authority. Now I'm going to ask you, do you like to challenge authority, God, especially God-given authority? They like to challenge authority and break the rules every now and again. And that is a dictionary definition. But I found it true even in the Bible. They like to break the rules. They like to challenge God-ordained authority. God's definition of rebellion in 1 Samuel 15, 23, He says, for rebellion is as the sin, or is not as, but is the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness, iniquity, and idolatry. So when you have a rebellious person, there's a spirit operating called rebellion. And he has got some other spirits with him, which is witchcraft, and stubbornness, and iniquity, and idolatry. So they are not just one spirit. There's a few of them working together. Rebellion always works together with a spirit of witchcraft, stubbornness. Some people are so 
so proud of their stubbornness. It's an ungodly trade. Iniquity. Where you really go out to sin knowingly, willingly. And you plan for the destruction of others. And idolatry. Idolatry. You say, but can, can a person be rebellious without bowing down before idols? Yes. Because somewhere in his or her life there is something that they have idolized. Even if it's themselves. Normally it's themselves if they don't physically bow before an idol. And you know, when, when you are under the sway of demonic forces like that, you are in fact worshipping them. That's your gods. And uh, the days of old in the Bible days, what they have done is they've just made themselves molten images of those demons, really, that were in them that they worship. And so, uh, the Bible is very clear about that. Now, that's the definition God gives. Now also let's look at the word pollute because the Bible says, Woe unto the rebellious uh, city and uh, her that is polluted. What is pollute? According to the Hebrew, it is to defile, to defile, to make dirty, to desecrate, to soil, to stain. Now, you'll always find that where demon activity is uh, prominent, they will always be filth. If there's demon activity in a city, you'll find filth lying all around in the city. When there's demon activity in a household, the house will always be dirty, filthy, unclean. And uh, uh, this is what rebellion does. The spirit of rebellion and witchcraft and stubbornness and idolatry uh, causes defilement, it causes dirtiness. When you get in, in touch with someone like that, you feel dirty in your spirit. When you drive through a city like that, you feel dirty. You want to go for a shower afterwards because it's a spiritual thing that defiles yourself. The Bible, the Bible also talks about uh, defiling your garment. Don't defile your garment. It's possible to be polluted and stain and defile your righteous garment. And uh, the only remedy for that is the blood of Jesus. To wash it in the blood of Jesus, meaning that you need to come and confess before God and restore relationship with God and let God wash you clean from that pollution. A false prophecy can defile you. Uh, sitting under false prophets can defile you. Sitting under false teaching can defile your heart and your garment. Amen? And so we must be very careful. We will at one stage teach on the discernment of spirits. I want to first present it to the pastors, and then we will also uh, speak on that in the church so that you can uh, refrain from being defiled and polluted. Amen? Now there's four has nots, four has nots that the rebellious has not done, that God is, uh, uh, is uh, bringing charge against the rebellion who is so polluted. Number one, she has not obeyed his voice. If you do not obey the voice of God, it's a sure sign that you are rebellious. If God's word clearly tells you not to do something and you go and you do it for whatsoever reason and excuse, you are rebelling against God and you are not obeying His voice. If God says, for example, and I bring it to where we are now in our planning, God says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation and you say, it's not for me and I'm not going to do it, you are disobeying God. It's a rebellious spirit. Amen. Whenever you come against what God says, corporately, through His delegated authority, you come against it and you say, I shall not do it, I don't agree, I don't want, I see it different, I will not. You are not obeying His voice and you are rebellious. And be sure that there is lurking witchcraft, uh, stubbornness, and idolatry. So she has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. A rebellious person does not like correction, does not want correction. 
And that is clearly seen in the book of Revelation when God talks about Jezebel, the rebellious one who did all kinds of things. God says, and I've given a space to repent, and God was uh, correcting her, and she refused to be corrected. God says, if she continues that way, he will kill her. He will call, give her over to death. And her children, with other words, those that she influenced, will come under the same judgment. So she has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. A rebellious person does not trust in the Lord, but only trusts in man and what man can do, or trust in self, what I can do, what works for me, what works in the world, uh, what the world says, making plans according to the world's uh, dictates and advice. We need to trust in the Lord in these days. More than ever, we should always trust in the Lord. But I want you to know more than ever, we should trust in the Lord in these days. Because it's only the Lord that will keep us safe. It's only the Lord that will provide for us. It's only the Lord that will heal us. It's only the Lord that will keep us in the right way. It's only the Lord that will keep us holy and just and righteous. Nothing else, no one else. Don't put your trust in a man. Put your trust in the Lord who cannot fail. The one who never lies. The one who never changes. The one in whom is no darkness. Trust the Lord. You cannot say, I trust the Lord, and then come and spew out negative stuff all the time. Trust in the Lord. Do what you can do in obedience to Him. When you do as Gideon did, what he could, what God told him to do, God did the rest. How many times has God not shown in the Word that he can do anything with little or with much? He doesn't need majority. He doesn't need a lot of people to do it through, just willing vessels. And with 300 people in, in Gideon's case, he wiped out Hundreds of thousands of the people of the East that came and tortured Israel year by year. Now what will God not do for us? We who are under the new covenant. We who are children of Abraham by faith. We who are seeking God with all of our hearts. We who say, Lord, use us as instruments to bring in the lost. How much the more will God not do it through us? How much the more will God not raise you up to heal the sick and to set the captives free? How much the more will God not keep you healthy and wealthy so that you can reach? Amen. Hey. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And then she has not drawn near to her God. God is constantly calling us to draw near to Him. And we must draw near to Him. The Bible says if we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. Do you want the presence of God in your life? Do you want the anointing upon your life? Do you want uh, uh, the ability to touch lives and see them changed? You have to draw near to God. Because it's only God that can do it through you. And the more time you spend with God, the more you push in and press in to the very presence of God, something about God rubs off on you. That anointing, that presence rubs off on you. If you don't believe it, read about Moses, who spent 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God. And he came down the mountain and his face shone, and, and so much so that the uh, children of Israel could not look upon his face. He had to put a veil there. Now, how much the more for you and I, when we press in and we stay in the presence of God day in, day out, I'm telling you, your countenance will change. Your physical body will change. You will begin to glow. Amen. You will glow in the dark, in the dark of this world. In the spiritual dark, you will grow. You will glow. And Satan will either run or some devilish moths will be attracted and you will be able to cast them out. 
They will cry out in your presence. What have we to do with you? Because they will see the presence of God on you. There's no other way. I'm telling you, there's no other way. But to pray focusedly, continuously, pressing in, pressing in, pressing in, without stop. And let God meet you. Let the presence of God come and proceed towards you. We need God in our lives. We need to put our trust in God. And this rebellious nation, people, did not draw near to her God. Amen? Now let's look again at disobedience. She has not obeyed his voice. Disobedience is the opposite of obedience. Just in case you didn't know that. That it is the opposite of obedience. Disobedience is not halfway obedience. You only obey when you have fully obeyed. When you have done everything. Think of King Saul. When Samuel met up with him. And he said, blessed be the man of God, and da, 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 I have done all that the Lord has given me to do. And Samuel said, now what is the noise of this bleating in my ears? No, but I've done everything the Lord has told me. Only I have spared Agag's life. And he said, no. Has the Lord as much pleasure in offering as in obeying the voice of the Lord? And he excused himself. No, we kept these, these animals the best to offer unto the Lord. And they already you can see his backslidden. He says, the Lord your God. Not the Lord my God. Not the Lord our God. The Lord your God. And his heart is already revealed there that he's departed from God in his heart. People always depart first in their hearts. And then they come with all these other things. It will not get into that. It is serious as God demands obedience to his voice. It's a very serious offense to, to be disobedient to the voice of God. His voice comes to us through the Bible and his spirit speaking in our hearts. It comes to us through preaching of the gospel. It comes to us uh, in, in uh, sometimes angels appearing, whatever. God can bring his voice to you. And when you identify the voice of God, be quick to hear it. And to listen to it, write it down, do it, do what he says. Amen. If it's something you need to do immediately, you do it immediately. If it's something that has a specific season that you must wait for, then you wait for it and God will release you to obey and to do the thing uh, uh, as he's told you. Now, many in their attempts to justify their disobedience give their own interpretation to the word of God. Well, I'm not called for that. Oh, this is not what I feel I should do. God's not really speaking to me. Somebody told me once, you know, offering and tithes is not for everybody. It's only for the priests. It's only for you pastors. You need to do that. And they twist the word of God to be disobedient to the word of God. I'm not coming to church this morning because my family from Polokwane has arrived. And my family comes first. Where did you get that? Did Jesus say that? Find out what Jesus said about that issue. And you'll think Jesus is unfair. Oh, I feel just to lay in today. I know God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but today, rainy day, day for reading a book, a novel, Francine and Rivers, or whatever, and make myself coffee and have rusks, or sit in front of the TV and watch that thing that I always wanted to see. God will understand. God knows my heart. Hey, God knows my heart. God knows I love him. I'm not going to let anybody judge me. I'm not going to let that preacher put condemnation on me by telling me the Bible says forsake not. God knows I need my rest from time to time, even, even though it's three weeks and a month, but God understands. Okay? And they interpret God's word and twist God's word to justify their disobedience. We are to obey immediately, as in many cases, it's a matter of life and death. Come on, people. 
Sometimes you can get away with disobedience. Or I shouldn't say it because you don't really get away with it. There's always a consequence, but sometimes the consequence is not so severe. But other times the consequences means life or death. You can die if you don't listen. A habit of disobedience leads to death and destruction. If you habitually disobey God, it will lead to death and destruction in your life. It's an open door for Satan to kill, steal, and to destroy. For example, a man of God was called as an evangelist. And uh, he operated as an evangelist for a while. And then decided that the prophets are doing better and so all of a sudden he stepped and he made himself a prophet, stepping into the office of a prophet and died as a result of that. Just like that. Died. Because he refused to obey God. Obey God. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Don't do what God has not called you to do. Don't operate in an office. This is now for the, for the, for the fivefold office gifts. Okay? And if you have a habit of disobedience, habit of coming against authority, habit of criticizing, habit of pulling down what God says through his ordained ministers, you are walking on dangerous ground. You are inviting death into your camp. And it can be spiritual death and physical death. She has not received correction. Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke. And I chasten them. Chasten means you are, you are giving them a bit of a hiding. Therefore be zealous and repent. God wants you and I, if he corrects us, to say yes, Lord, and do it quickly. Cut off, do it, Ooh, change. If it, very quickly, zealous. Zealous means with zeal. It means with speed. Okay? Speed. <laughs> I'm so tempted to say that. Well, I'm going to say that. Yesterday when we drove, there was one of our cars that was not so zealous. <laughs> and we got, uh, we got a bit worried because we couldn't see them in the, in the rear wheel mi mirror. And those, so they send us a message, no, they've missed a turn off, they're on the way to Durban. <laughs> and, and, and they lied. They, they were just catching us. Rebuke and chasten has to do with correction, discipline, and education. So when God rebukes you, when God corrects you, it is for your education. It is for your discipline. But if you continue to do it, and do it after God has corrected you and corrected you. You do not want to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is a consuming fire, my friend. Paul says we've done all of our best to present to you the goodness of God, but also the severity of God if you do not stay in His goodness. Come on. She has not received correction. The correct response to correction is to repent and to do it zealously. We grow spiritually when we accept correction and repent. People who forever resist authority and go their own way never grow. They never grow. They never grow beyond baby stage. And I'm not talking about knowledge. I'm talking about the application of the word of God. How do you know someone is mature in the Lord? They are doers of the word. They do what they've received light. As they've received light from the word of God. People who forever resist authority and go their own way. Never grow. They become more and more critical. Bitter and resentful. They will resent other ministers. They will resent other Christians. They will be bitter against the fivefold ministry. They will be bitter against the church. They will eventually end up sitting at home all bitter and twisted and uh, 
It's sad to see them that way. It's the same as driving past an old scrapyard, seeing these old scrapped up motor vehicles that could have been. She has not trusted in the Lord. Psalm 125 verse 1 says in the New King James, Those that trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. I remember driving down in Randburg down. I can't remember the name of that street because they've changed it now. But I, 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 I've lost everything. Lost house, lost everything. We were living with friends I lost my business, and it was on a, a billboard continuously this psalm. Those that trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. And I said, yes, Lord, I'm taking that. And I spoke that and kept on speaking it. And God brought us out. Although the going was slow, God brought us out of much. Now the rebellious at heart trust not in God because they resist him. They resist him. How will they trust in him? They are already rebellious against him. They don't like him. They don't like his ways. They don't like his people. And so they will resist him. They trust in themselves or they trust in other men. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with half of your heart, with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding so amazing sometimes you preach a word and you know it's from God and people go out and they do exactly the opposite trust in the Lord lean not on your own understanding now I can figure it out for myself I will do just this 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 and then it will be fine and and where they end up they can do nothing for God anymore They've tied themselves up because they leaned on their own understanding. Your own understanding will get you into trouble. Your own understanding will get you into? Say this if you know, uh, believe it. Your own understanding will get you into? What kind of trouble? A big trouble. Trusting self instead of God, is idolatry. If you say, I know God's word says this, the pastor said it, the pastor preached it, but I'm not going to do it, I'm going to do it this way. You are into idolatry. Amen? You are into idolatry. And if I was pastor Hugh, I would sing that song to you. I did it my way. And that's such an unscriptural, ungodly song. I did it my way. Because I was the God in that song. Okay. When pressure comes and challenges your belief in the word of God. Let me say it so that you can understand it. When pressure comes and challenges your belief in the word of God. What will your response be? And get, guess what? When you start living for God with all of your heart, and you've decided, man, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm finished with the world, finished with the old life. I'm just going to be focused on the Lord. All of a sudden, challenges come. Challenging your uh, knowledge of the Word of God. Yeah, but did God really mean this? Does this really apply to you? You're going to lack if you do this. Man, it's not going to work out for you. You will see. So and so also tried it, and they made a mess, and it didn't work out for them. And so the devil will challenge you. But it's when you yield to that, that you will eventually end up with all the others ended up. No, you just say, it doesn't matter what comes my way, doesn't matter what I feel or see, the word of God is working mightily in me. And you confess that and you stay with that. Uh, things may fall around you, it may look like you are, you are finished, but remember Job. He refused 
to let go of God. And I'm sure that God will not take you as far as he took Job, as far in the test. And uh, when you come through the test, man, oh man, you'll be full of faith. You'll be able to help people. Uh, Satan will not be able to pull you easily down. Amen? So what will your response be when Satan challenges your belief? And this thing breaks, and that thing breaks, and this thing goes wrong, and that thing goes wrong. Will you say, oh, I'm just going to give up? I've heard it so many times. When I didn't serve Jesus, it was well with me. When I didn't serve Jesus, I always had extra money. When I, served, uh, when I didn't serve Jesus, you know, I had friends uh, and all kinds of things. And Jesus has called you to leave all of that behind, to walk the straight and the narrow. And he has called you to be content when you have food and clothing. Because you are not called to settle down in this world. You are passing through. Yeah, your home is not here. It's in heaven. So why bother trying to get riches together for the last days? Oh, if God gives you and blesses you with much, then you know it is to minister to the poor. It's to minister and give into the work of God. That's why God brings finance to you. No other reason. Come on, some people cannot even die. They struggle to die on their deathbeds because they are so attached to the silver and the gold. They want to take it with them. And they cannot deal with the fact that they can take nothing out of this world. I'll say it again. It's already a cliche, but I'm saying it again. You can only take souls with you that got saved because of you. And you will shine as bright as the firmament when you lead a lot of people to Jesus. He that wins souls is wise. Amen? Not he that has the most money. Are you going to go by God's word no matter what circumstances look like? That's something you have to answer. Am I going to go by God's work? Satan will create some storms to make you take your eyes of God. Think of Peter. The storm, when Peter looked at the storm, took his eyes of Jesus, started to sink. And Satan is a master storm creator. And you just stand firm in the storm. Have your confession the same. Do not lose or let go of your confession that God is with you. And uh, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to Satan if you know he's near. Hey, he hates it. He hates it when you preach the gospel to him. He runs. Now, it's not draw near to God. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify hearts, double-minded. So he gives us a little bit of a key here of how to draw near to God. It's, it's in prayer and it's in the word, but while you are doing that, make sure your hands are clean. What does that mean? That you have confessed all of your sin. That you've made right with everybody that you should have made right with. And that your hearts are purified. There's no evil agenda in your heart. You're not praying with a specific agenda, selfish agenda. You are praying with the agenda of God only. So purify the hearts, you double-minded. Okay. When you're not close to God, He's also not close to you. That's what you will feel and experience. Although He's everywhere, if you're not close to God, you will experience that He's not close to you. And if that closeness of God is not there, guess what happens? Someone is there to fill the void. A void must always be filled, and Satan will fill that void. The world and its influences under the sway of Satan will fill that void. The world is in rebellion to God. This you must know. You cannot live in the world. Amen? How, we, how do we draw near to God? We obey Him. We receive His instruction and His correction. We trust in Him. We read and study 
Bible daily so that you can know what he says. We pray and sometimes combine that with fasting. As you heard this morning, on Tuesdays we're going to fast for specific things. We worship together and individually. We attend church and we living for God every day. That's how you draw close to God. And if you feel like a little bit far from God, then you put in effort to go and pray, to go and study the Word, to separate yourself with God. Amen? To, to put on some worship music and to uh, draw near to God. Amen? Now, I don't want any one of us to be rebellious. If you have, through the preaching of the Word, identified in your life areas of rebellion, I would really implore you to change that. To come before God and say, Lord, I'm a rebellious, obstinate, obnoxious, stubborn person. And I want you to change this. I confess it and I ask you, come and remove this. Let my heart become pliable. Let the word of God crush that rebellion. He, you know, rebellion is like every other sin. It can be repented of. You can repent of it. And I would want you to repent of that. Amen. Now, for the sake of not embarrassing you, I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm just going to say, I'm going to make an altar call. If you were rebellious, you've identified you were rebellious, as you sit there, and I pray a prayer, and you ask God to remove it from you. And so for that matter, we're going to pray all together, okay? So that nobody's excluded, and if you're not rebellious, you pray it anyway for the sake of those. You say, Lord, remove rebellion from our congregation so that we can do the will of God. Amen. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us. You love us so much that you correct us and that you chasten us because we are children of God. And so, Lord, we confess the rebellion in our hearts. Lord, the hardness of our hearts the stubbornness, the disobedience. And we ask you to forgive us. Lord, cast out of our lives every spirit of rebellion, every spirit of idolatry, every spirit of obnoxiousness, every spirit of stubbornness, and Lord, fill us with your Spirit. The Spirit of the fear of the Lord. The Spirit of knowledge. The Spirit of wisdom. The Spirit of counsel. The Spirit of might. The Spirit of holiness. The Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for that. Amen. God bless you. And know that he's for you. He's never against you. Rise, let us pronounce God's blessing upon you. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you and I want to just bless these dear people who have been faithful to come to the house of the Lord to serve you, to worship you, and to hear what the Spirit has to say. And Lord, as in the days of old, I ask that you will cause your face to shine upon them, that you will bless the work of their hands, that whatever they do and touch for God will be prosperous. Pray that you will give them boldness, that they will be testimonies and witnesses for Jesus. Lord, that you will increase them in every area of their lives, that in their going out and their coming in, they will be so blessed, so protected, because you, Lord... Give angels charge over them. Lord, command now the hosts of heaven and cause them 
to be those ministering spirits to all of these who are heirs of salvation. By protection, by blessing them, by bringing them into uh, contact with divine appointments that they may prosper in every way. Keep them healthy, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ died for us, paid in full for our sickness, our disease, our infirmities, and our iniquities and sins. And by His stripes we are healed. And by His shed blood we are forgiven. We are children of God, and Satan has no right in our lives. We are bought with a price, not like as unto silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we give you thanks for that. And now, Lord, let us go out of this place knowing who we are, that we are lights of this world, salt of the earth. Use us for your glory, we pray, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen and amen.